Thesis number four, the power of the people, institutions of participation and democracy. All right. The question can be formulated in a few words. The organization of political communities of millions of people by means of direct de democracy being impossible. I would, direct democracy is where everybody works in a parliamentary fashion, like everybody's part of the parliament. It, with that being impossible with uh, millions of people involved, there was a need since millennia, since thousands and thousands of years ago, at least since the large cities in the Mediterranean and Mesopotamia around 3000 BC, of instituting structures of representation, representational democracy. The potentia, or the political power in itself of the political community, is the institutions, the potestas, which allow for the delegated exercise of an indicated power. The delegation of power creates its own proper set of problems. The most serious, the slow distancing of the representant from the represented and its subsequent fetishizing, right? Uh, it, many people in the United States believe that there's no other way to do democracy than through representation and especially representation that's dominated uh, by by financial interests that donate, you know, millions of dollars to campaigns and things like that. Like it just has to be that way, but, would, but this is not true. Um, the one who exerts the power as delegate affirms itself as the very self-referential site of political power, defining it as a legitimate dom uh, domination that gains the obedience of the citizens. In Max Weber's description, the political community as the originary site of power is transformed into the passive object of a consensus as obedience to authority of the one to which power had been invested originarily through delegate representation. The power is supposed to belong to the people, but through a fetishization of representative democracy and rather than having the Washington consensus be in a leadership role, switching to a dominance role, uh, now you just have this uh, consensus of obedience on the part of, of uh, people in the United States, for example. But of course, Dussel is thinking about this in Mexico and Argentina in particular, but also throughout all Latin America. The delegate becomes the one who exercises the monopoly of power and the represented, the voters, uh, ones have lost all their attributes. For sure, the community of citizens creates the representative institutions from the multiplicity or the, uh, or the county, or from the municipality or the county, to the province or regional state, to the national territorial state, or to international organizations or organisms. These representative institutions managed by political parties can turn into organisms for the domination of citizens, which express their will only every four to six years, confirming through universal vote the candidates which the political parties and actual powers behind the scenes have previously elected in an elitist manner without the democratic participation of the community. In this way, we reach the circle in which Latin American politics finds itself. After the democratic opening, posterior to the fall of the mil military dictatorship since about 1984, where the political parties monopolized the political life falling into a profound corruption, the first being to unconsciously situate the site of power in its governing will, forgetting that the ontological site of power is the people, the Puebla. Hannah Arendt remembers that Thomas Jefferson, way before the Paris Commune, uh, was obsessed with an issue, the division of counties, municipalities, into districts, uh, 
Jefferson thought that the elemental republic should allow for the citizens in, everyday, uh, in the everyday world to habitually gather in the districts, which would be the Soviets of the October Revolution in Russia in 1917, and which today we would call the neighborhood, the town, the base, the community, the cabildos of the Bolivarian Constitution of uh, 1999 in Venezuela, every organization under the municipalities. Just like a Tocqueville had described within the utopic communities of the Pilgrims or the Founding Fathers of the United States. These are self-managing communities of direct democracy which would assume everyday responsibilities. Um, so, uh, he DeSalle is pointing out that Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of the United States, thought that some form of direct democracy should be going on at, in local communities. And we see that, that that's not even the case in the United States. Um, and of course, across Latin America, also not the case. Jefferson knew very well that what he proposed as the salvation of the Republic signified effectively the salvation of the revolutionary spirit in the Republic. Comments are in. All of his explanations of the revolutionary system begun with the reminder of the role carried out by the small republics with the energy which animated our revolution in its origins. That's quoting Thomas Jefferson. On this basis, he would trust on districts, communities under the counties or municipalities, as the instrument to attain that the citizens continue doing what they had shown to be able to do during the years of the revolution. That is to act responsibly and to participate in political matters. Direct democratic participation. Just like in the revolution. Jefferson is referring to the problematic that we have sketched in, the, in this work. That is to say, in the revolutionary moment of the colonial political community, which had remained unified under the directive of the historical English metropolitan bloc in, in power, exercising authority with the consensus of the colonizers, and which separated itself through the emergence of a North American people that generated a new hegemonic project that unified the revolutionary will, and from its descent took on a fight of liberation against the British crown. The English colonists were, not, were, um, were uh, controlled by a power block in London uh, for decades and decades and decades, and that was working fine, but at a certain point, uh, the North American colonists became self-conscious as a political body and rebelled against the British crown, effectively, because they were a people and they could constitute themselves at a, as a people in the way that Dussel wants to think of this. This intervention of the people, which situated as its enemies the colonizing English and the colonial collaborators as the surge of a political active plebs, could, as the independent republic was institutionalized, lose its politically creative, permanent, responsible conscience. The people, as plebs, fell asleep as a new populace, as a political community that turned passive, obedient to the new historical bloc in power, the nation industrial bourgeoisie in the north and the, sal uh, the slaving oligarchy in the south. So they had this revolutionary spirit, the, the American, uh, North American revolutionaries against the British crown, constituted itself as a people, but then quickly went to sleep and allowed itself to be managed uh, by the power block of the emerging industrial bourgeoisie in the north and the traditional slaving oligarchy in the south. Jefferson tried to maintain, in front of the institutions of representation, the presence of the originary experience of the participative democracy. He failed. In the same way, Lenin, in Russia, in the beginning, gave all the power to the Soviets. And the Soviets, uh, I don't know if I've explained this before, and I don't know if you've read this, but the Soviets, ideally, were, were community organizations that involved direct democracy. Everybody could talk. Everybody could vote, 
And then they would send representatives up to higher Soviets, and there's a kind of hierarchy of these Soviets. That was the original concept of the Soviet Union. Um, and so this direct democracy at the local level uh, was, was uh, very much part of the, the ideals of the original Russian Revolution. So in the same way, Lenin in the beginning gave all the power to the Soviets, to the communes, to direct popular democracy. It was total chaos. It moved from one extreme to the other. The NEP was all the power to the institutions directed by the Bolshevik party. The issue is then how to articulate the representative institutions, always in a process of transformation or perfection around political parties and around the three already existing powers, executive, judicial, and legislative, through new participative institutions that allow beyond parties and from the very base for a real actualization with direct democracy in the small communities of the people. Of the hyperpotentia or the permanent exercise through time without having to wait the punctual intervention every four to six years whenever there's votes through the confirmation of a representative already elected by others right of the popular will the cabildos uh, the districts the neighborhood communities the towns etc would be organizations under the municipalities adding to a few thousand uh, citizens gathered in every week in, in even weekly meetings where the citizens would assume responsibility with assigned resources and being judicially founded in the Constitution and the corresponding laws for issues such as the security of the community, the distribution of water and sewage, the education of the youth, the uh, embellishment of places, the responsibility for health, the cooperatives of consumption and even production, etc. That is to say, the effective exercise of political power would descend from the municipality to the community at the very base. So we have some kind of grassroots participatory uh, uh, democracy. From these millions of organisms where direct democracy would, would be carried out, as through polling stations, for example, in Mexico, there are uh, 130,000 within the nation, National Electoral Register, the participative political life would be transformed into every, an everyday activity of the citizens. Moreover, they would be coordinated in webs within the municipalities, within the provinces, until reaching presence in the national state. This web of webs would constitute the power of citizenship, which would oversee the other powers, executive, judicial, legislative would oversee the executive, the judicial, the legislative. The participation would be in this sense permanently guaranteed in the political community of an active and critical consensus which would oversee the representation of professional politicians organized in political parties, would oversee the representatives. Um, uh, and so, you know, Dussel is calling here for like that ideal Soviet uh, kind of structure, uh, which you know totally went haywire in the in the Russian Revolution uh, very quickly. If new transformations were to be added to these participatory, particip <laughs> participative institutions, such as revoking referendums, where the grassroots uh, uh, Soviets or, or whatever you're going to call them could actually recall representatives at any time. That's what he's revoking referendums. That's what a revoking referendum is. Um, if new transformations were to be added to these participative institutions, such as revoking referendums, the possibility that the citizens in certain proportion could pre present projects of law, etc. They could actually propose legislation would take away from the representation its stiff bureaucratism and would speed up the participation of citizens, get citizens more involved, allow them to do legislative uh, proposals, have them be able to revoke a, a representative to call them back and, and put somebody else in. All of this would reduce the bureaucratization of government. 
and and um, and now notice that this this appeals to problems that um, people both on the right and the left who are dissatisfied with traditional liberal bourgeois politics, like the Republicans and the Democrats. But this gets replicated all over the world and all throughout Latin America. Um, there's people on the left and on the right that that don't like the bureaucracy of government. And so Dussel is suggesting here a way to make the government less bureaucratic by instituting this direct democracy. Um, and it would allow the citizens to act more immediately. Like if somebody is not doing their job, you can take them out and replace them. You don't have to wait four to six years or two years or whatever the case may be. Of course, one would always have to consider governability and stability in the exercise of power delegated to representation. But one would have to choose a fair mean between the revocation of mandates and governable, governable stability. Without representation, participation falls into an ungovernable, ungovernable chaos. All the power to the Soviets without participation, uh, without participation and representation turns stiff. It is fetishized, corrupted. All the power to the monopoly of political parties. Right. So there's these two extremes. You can have a chaotic uh, direct democracy where things get really strange very fast, or you can have a domination of political parties who pre-select candidates and, you know, people are even discouraged. Uh, remember, and you may not remember, you know, some of us are very young, but when uh, Donald Trump won the election, one reason that he won be was because um, many Democrats wanted to vote for and they wanted uh, Bernie Sanders to be the candidate. And um, and they were just simply told, no, you can't vote for Bernie Sanders. That would that would be evil. Uh, it would be the end of the world. You would be a, a traitor. Um, I can't remember exactly the lingo that they used, but that was that was the kind of uh, that was the kind of message that was sent is that people really couldn't vote their conscience. And, and, and so a lot of Democrats just stayed home. They didn't vote for Hillary because they weren't excited about her. Uh, they had this other candidate that, that had been around uh, that they were more excited about. Um, and, and I imagine that some people, uh, you know, even Democrats voted for Trump because they were um, so uh, disaffected by, by this strategy of the Democratic Party to just shut down people who wanted a uh, a viable candidate. They wanted the the standard old, you know, uh, the wife of President Bill Clinton, you know, to to be in there, um, and so the party just monopolized the whole process, you know, and shot itself in the foot in that case. But sometimes, uh, you know, that's the way the way these political parties consolidate power is through similar means. So, um, you know, that's not really great democracy when you tell a, a large faction of your party that they can't vote for the person they want. Um, and and, and uh, I should mention too that um, the Democratic Party, when the primaries were going on, when it was a race between Bernie Sanders being the presidential candidate and Hillary Clinton being the presidential candidate, the Democratic Party um, maneuvered to favor Hillary Clinton in a, in a, in a totally undemocratic way. They fixed the, the primary vote. So, I mean, you know, which is, is, you know, part of what happens in political parties. Uh, and sometimes that does consolidate their power. But in this case, it just happened to be one of those where it all kind of came to light uh, before the general election, the presidential election, and it ended up really undermining the Democratic Party. Um, so we can see, you know, that's that's a problem when political parties act this way. And, and of course, the Republicans do the same thing. Or, you know, it's, it's not, this is not um, 
the private reserve of the Democratic Party or, uh, or of the Republican Party. This is the way that political parties work. Unless you build into your democratic um, institutions some way for the people to be able to have more power. But what Dussel is saying is uh, if you make it too open, uh, too democratic, then you get chaos. Uh, so there has to be some kind of happy medium. It is necessary to invent a new articulation between open representation, revocable, overseen by a real democracy, and the direct participation of citizens, permanent, responsible, and constitutional, as the exercise of power of the people. If the power is supposed to be with the people, then we need to get the balance right. But his point is that uh, the way that representative democracy works, especially under the Washington consensus, all throughout Latin America and, and in most places where democracy exists around the world, it, things are in favor of, of political party monopolization. And we move into an area where instead of having political parties that lead, as I was suggesting that both the Republicans and Democrats did in the mid 20th century, you have political parties that dominate and don't respond to the voters. You know, you have the largest protest in the history of the universe uh, in the lead up to the 2003 uh, invasion of Baghdad. Uh, and, and the invasion goes forward with, without a hitch, not a hiccup, no, no slowdown, no, no change of agenda, just Full, full steam ahead. Uh, but that happens all the time. Bernie Sanders. No, he can't be the candidate. The party decided he can't be the candidate. It doesn't matter if most of the Democrats want him. It doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there has to be some way of allowing political parties to manage things to an extent, but not get in, but, but still lead rather than dominate. And uh, all right, so let's leave that at that. So this is an interesting idea. Okay, uh, 